Welcome back to part two of this week's episode of Leading Our Own Way, featuring our special guests. Now let's dive right back into the conversation and continue exploring their incredible journey. I, th I think this is probably a good time to, um, before we get into a little bit more personal about yourself, tell us a little bit about Zachary's personality. Zachary was always really laid back. Um, nothing ever really bothered him. Uh, even through all of the, for your viewers to know, uh, both of my kids had a lot of medical special needs and my son had a rare condition. And one of the things I had to do for his rare condition, especially early on in his life, was I had to give him a catheter every four hours because even though he went to the bathroom and he, he didn't always get the sensation of going to the bathroom. And from time to time, uh, yes, that was when he was younger. Uh, I think he was three or four in that picture. I don't remember, Yeah. but, um, um, because of his rare condition, uh, especially early on, he wouldn't always go to the bathroom. So I would have to help him to go to the bathroom. And, you know, anybody that has ever had a catheter, especially of the male gender, it's not the most pleasant experience to have a catheter put up in that region of the male body. Hmm. And so my son got to the point because that's all he ever knew was he would lay on the floor. He'd put his hands behind his head and he'd look at me like, go ahead, old man, let's get this done. <laughs> and, like I could, I got to the point where I was quick at it and I could do it and he wouldn't even flinch wow. uh, doing it. So he was that, he was always very happy. He never, I mean, he never knew a stranger. He lit up every room he was in. He, mm -hmm. I mean, he wanted to, I mean, he wanted to hug everybody. He was very trusting, which is good in a sense, but from a parent's perspective, knowing what I know of the world, you go, it's great that you're trusting, but you got to have a little bit of skepticism here and there. Yeah. Um, so, and then he, he definitely loved women. Uh, that was his favorite topic. Um, <laughs> he had, he had a hierarchy of uh, women. It was blonde haired, uh, blonde haired, brown haired, brunette, red, uh, blonde haired, brown haired, brunette, black haired and redheads in that order. Wow. And so like in the special needs organization, the lady that's the chairwoman of it, uh, on the trip that we went on, you can see in pictures there, uh, that were taken that just the look in his eyes towards her, like he fell in love with her. You could see it in his face. And every time she would come around, he'd open his arms like, Hey, I want a hug. Oh. And, uh, so yeah, he, he was the most laid back child I think I've ever met, which is completely opposite as to how I am in real life. Oh, well, that, that was, that was kind of funny. Mm. <laughs> what you about him. Um, well, Jason, we do have something in common. We're both educators and mm. tell us what you do for a living. Uh, well, I am in education. I've been in education on and off for numerous years. Initially, when I graduated from the university I went to, I graduated graduated with a degree in health and physical education, K-12, so that I could teach physical education, uh, elementary, middle, or high school. Um, I got into an elementary school, and I taught elementary school physical education for almost nine years. Um, uh, so towards the end of it, my last year in, well, let me go back. I was in there uh, almost nine years. And then towards the end of it, uh, I left out to be a stay at home parent just because of medical issues with my kids. And after my son had passed, I realized that uh, just to get back into work, I was going to try to get into education again because I'd been out so long that my certifications had lapsed. and in the States, you get certified and while you're working in the school system, you can do uh, professional development or go back to school and you can earn credits to get recertified because we have to get X number of credits over five years to get recertified yeah. is kind of how it goes. And that's how we stay certified throughout our career, If especially if we don't go back to school, which a lot of people do. Um, so my certifications had lapsed and I got back into the, the county I live in. And now I'm a, in the States, we call it a paraprofessional, but it's essentially a teacher's aid is, is, uh, what we call it. Same here. Yeah. 
And um, I did that because I knew when I was teaching the best way to get an, a school system or a principal to know who you are is to either substitute teach on a regular basis or you become a teacher's aide in a school system so they know your style, who you are, so that if I were to get recertified or want to go back in a, in kind of a slightly different field, they would know me and whether they had a spot open, they could recommend me. And mm -hmm. so that's more or less why I got back in. So I'm a, I'm a teacher's aide and this year we'll be in an EBD room, which I've uh, which around here is emotional behavior disorder students. It's a self-contained classroom. It's it's very active, very, for lack of better words, sometimes aggressive students. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's currently what I'm doing. And right now, whereas y'all are on your winter break, I'm on my summer break. Yeah. Yeah. I work in, uh, I work in some schools like that. Uh, here mm -hmm. as well so I, I can totally I can picture what your day looks like mm -hmm. um do you um but your degrees in uh, phys ed isn't it in physical physical mm -hmm. education yes that is correct yeah but when was the last time you taught PE then uh 2011 so it's now wow it's now been 13 years since I last taught physical education any plans to go back in that direction or you know, I've thought about it, but like in uh, in the states here, when your certification laps, lapses, mm -hmm. essentially what you have to do is you have to go back to school and pick up some of the more current classes, and then you have to go back and take the certification test, mm -hmm. which is not a problem. But in my degree, like most degrees, you only have to take one certification test. I have to take two certification tests and pass them both. Oh. So I have to take one specifically for physical education and I have to take one specifically for health wow. is what I have to do. And the first time I took it uh, under full transparency, I did not pass either of them the first time I took just because I didn't know what was on there. I didn't know what to expect. Yeah. And so once I got an idea for it, I passed them on the, on the second go around. Uh, but, and those were not easy certification tests by any stretch of the imagination. So, you know, I've thought about it. I, I haven't really pulled pulled the trigger on it, so to speak. Honestly, with kind of the momentum I'm getting with all this letters to Zachary stuff, I'm trying to see if I can kind of make this a career change. Although mm -hmm. I, it hasn't quite happened, at least on the financial end, if you will. Yeah. So, but I, I'm 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 trying to make this a little more of a career idea versus going back, but we'll see. Yeah. Well, and we'll dive in that because that's pretty much where I end the uh, conversation at the end is you, your future. So, we'll, I want to know a little bit more about that little a little mm -hmm. later on. Um, what made you get into um, education in the first place? You know, I had all well. First of all, when I the first university I went to had nothing to do with education. I went to well, I was at the time I was a member of the United Methodist Church here in the states, and uh, I always loved my youth, my youth pastor, youth director, and I thought, well, what? And I mean, I was I was pretty much a, a pretty consistent church goer, and. Uh, at the time, I thought, well, what better, you know, working with kids and, you know, kind of doing the religious aspect of it. And so I went to school to be a youth pastor. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I, you know, I, uh, I, my first degree was in religion and philosophy, and then I changed it to Christian education. And then just somewhere in that second end of my third year, I just, I just decided that this wasn't the path for me. I don't remember what changed in my brain as to why I didn't want to do it, but I just decided it just wasn't the direction I wanted to go. And so I transferred into the local university where that's near to me. And, you know, my mother, who's a career educator, uh, said, well, you've always been good with kids. You've always liked sports. Have you ever thought about teaching physical education? Hmm. And so, so I thought, well, you know, that's not a bad idea. And so I just, I kind of went from there and I got a degree. And um, now right after I graduated, I did not get hired on. I was kind of out for two years just because I don't know about where you're at, but in the States, those people that get P PE degrees, I mean, the the guys and girls that do it 
you can teach PE to like into your sixties. I mean, it's, it's, there are PE teachers around here. I know they've done it forever. So for positions to open up, mm. it, sometimes it can be difficult. Like there's a lot of us that even though I live in the County that I'm in, that we may have to go a County or two over just to find a spot. Yeah. And so I just happened to luck into it, into a brand new school that was opening up. And the reason why I knew that was because my mother was opening that school in her position and followed the principal there. And so they found out the position was opening up and my mother called me and said, hand in uh, what hand deliver your resume to such and such person today. Yeah. And so that's what I did. And it just went from there. I can relate to you on it because I do know how difficult it is because I taught, well, I I kind of taught PE in the high school system back in Manchester. I was mm -hmm. what you call a cover supervisor. So you could have a degree, work at a school, but you was classed as a non-teaching uh, staff. So mm -hmm. you could help support the classes. And if a teacher was away, you could take the classes, right? Mm -hmm. But you couldn't carry the children through the curriculum. So let's say yeah. the teacher was off for six weeks. You couldn't take that class. They'd have to bring somebody in. But if mm -hmm. they were off for a day, for example, you, you, yeah. could, you could go and take that class. Um, and I was in the DP PE department probably like 50% of the week uh, supporting mm -hmm. the classes, the special needs and um, the, yeah. the other the other lower end needs as well. And um, and it was, you know, it was quite a rough school as well. So you, you were in there for, for that side of things. Mm -hmm. But um, when I, f I tried to get onto the course, uh, the, what you call the PGCE in England, and uh, I went for a couple mm -hmm. of interviews because of how popular it was. Everyone was recession had hit. Everyone was leaving the jobs trying to become PE teachers. And it was just full on. I, I found out if I was to do that one year course um, at that time of that graduation, I think there was something when I left England to come to Australia, there was like two PE high school jobs in the whole of UK going. And oh, wow. I mean, the population in the UK is, there's, I mean, there's much to put it in perspective. There's more people in the UK than there is here in Australia. And well, in the greater uh -huh. London area, there is never mm -hmm. mind if they're everywhere else. Um, so that's half the reason outside of basketball is why I, or how mm. I ended up in Australia was to come and do my primary education course at Australian university. That's mm -hmm. why I'm here. Um, oh. anyway, enough of me, <laughs> but you, so you talked about religion. Um, mm -hmm. would you, st would you consider yourself still religious, quite religious now, even though you didn't go that in that direction? Oh yeah. I mean, I'm still a part of the, the church and, um, uh, you know, as we all know, in kind of the Protestant Protestant side of religion, there's all different denominations. Um, mm. I basically grew up Methodist just about all of my life. Um, when I met my wife, who's from the north, uh, new uh, the northeast kind of part of the U.S., that's a heavily Catholic area. Her mm. whole family's Catholic, and so I, I went a little while for her, although which I had talked to my wife, I dis there's a lot of things with the Catholic church that I disagreed with just their uh, belief system, kind of how, how w what they do and don't expect. It was different than what I'd ever been, uh, ever been used to. Mm. And so like my wife had said, well, she just wanted to be married in the Catholic church. And after that, we could kind of make a decision. And I said, that's fine. I have no issue with that. So after we got married, we went kind of non-denominational for a while. And then uh, we stepped away only just because churches are great, but there's a lot of churches having two special needs child. Like when you do like, you know, like a lot of parents, they'll take their kids to the Sunday school classes and then the parents will go up in the service and then the kids will be down in the Sunday school classes. Well, even though medical special needs are still, are a, big thing and people know about them all that there's a lot of churches that they won't come out and say it, but they basically in so many words will say they don't want your kids there because they don't want the liability Wow! Really? in case something should happen and so for a long while we didn't go to church and then the church we're currently have been at for several years now the the girl there was a girl that actually made a specifically special needs part of their Sunday school classes, a program there that we just, we found that has been phenomenal. Oh, good and, and, and like, 
she never advertised the group. It just, it spread because of word of mouth. Cause because the, the biggest thing with the special needs community, why a lot of us didn't go to church is because we couldn't find anywhere we could take our kids just because of just all the multitude of different abilities and understandings and that kind of thing. So, uh, I we're now, we've been at a Baptist church for three or four years now. Uh, my wife still says to this day, I can't believe I'm going to a Southern Baptist church, which <laughs> the stereo, the stereotype of is there, you know, you know, hellfire and brimstone and they're thumping Bibles and, you know, everybody's going to hell for everything. And, and which that's not the case at all at our church. And so, yeah, we're, uh, we haven't been as active lately just because of life, but yeah, we're, we're generally pretty active. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, it was a shame that they couldn't cater originally for the needs of the children, wasn't it? That's such yeah. a shame. Yeah. Um, now in that time we did go to a couple of churches that did, but as upset as I was about kind of the comment, the, with the roundabout comment, I, in the back of my brain, I kind of understood it because I'm like, I even told my wife, I said, well, would you really want to leave our kids with people that didn't really under at least grasp the idea of the fact that they had medical issues? Yeah. I mean, would you feel comfortable going up in the service for an hour with the reality that something could happen and that mm. person would have no idea even close of what to do or who to call? So. Yeah, of course. It makes sense, doesn't it? Absolutely. You, you, I remember you saying in the Bible, um, in the in the pre-chat that we had a few weeks ago, and I never heard this term, but Atlanta is is considered the, or, you, or maybe it's your word and I don't know, mm. uh, the, ba the Bible Belt, is that right? Yes. In the southern United States, uh, traditionally speaking, the South is considered the Bible Belt, and it's... Ah. Honestly, I don't, I, I kind of, I get the idea of where that came from. I don't know the original reason, but the running joke around the South is if you don't find a church you like, just drive to the next corner because there's literally one on every other corner. And yeah. like, e even in the city I'm in, I can think of at least six just in my area of yeah, different wow. churches of, you know, Methodist, Baptist, non-denominational, uh, Church of God, Lutheran, uh, Catholic. Uh, yeah, I think those are all just in my area. Yeah, wow. And so that that that's the bigger reason as to why it's called the Bible Belt. Sure. Yeah, growing up in England at the top of my street where my mum still lives, um, you talk, you walk to the top and you can see four pubs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, never, not, not, well, you can see churches, but four yeah, pubs yeah. anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So um, you grew up pretty much in the area that you're currently living is, or not too far anyway. Is, is that right? I have been in my current area for, wow, almost 30 years. Has it been? Yeah, yeah right. it's been almost 30 years. Because you're 47, is that right, Jason? Yes, I'm 47. Yeah. Uh, so the, the short and sweet of it is this. I was born in uh, Marinette, Wisconsin, which in the States, that's north of Green Bay, Wisconsin, which is way up north. It's almost Canada. Yeah. Uh, from there, I did that because of the company my father worked for. He got transferred up there. Then my father got transferred to north of Seattle, Washington, which is on the West Coast I've because of the yeah. same company mm. uh, in, a, in a smaller town called Marysville, Washington. And then my father got transferred down to Mobile, Alabama, which oh, wow. is deep in uh, the heart of the South, almost on the Gulf Coast. Um, and I was there most of my life, most of my formative years. Like I went to elementary, middle and high school there. Uh, I, I started my college experience in Alabama, but then in that my first year of, of university, uh, my parents moved into Georgia. So like right after that, when it got out that first break, instead of going home to Mobile, I drove into Georgia for the first time to where my parents were living. Uh, and that's how me, I started living in Georgia. So in a, I've kind of gone around the country in a roundabout way. But I mean, I've been in Georgia since 1995. Wow. So how old were you when, they, when you went to Georgia finally when you, to uh, see your parents? I was 18. 18. And what were you doing? What were you doing then? School or a job? 
uh, th- well, like I said, I had re- the first school I went to, I went for uh, a religious degree, and then right. when yeah. I uh, when I finally left there, I transferred into the University of West Georgia, which is near me. Yeah. Um, so essentially, I was still going into school those first two years, and um, when I graduated after those first two years, just because I couldn't find a position where I wanted to find a position. Oh, yeah. This uh, is I, a story, Jason. I remember this. Uh, um, I got on at the Atlanta, uh, at Hartsfield Jackson International Airport. I worked for Delta Airlines for two years. Um, for those that have worked in an airport environment, the 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 rather roundabout uh, title of my position was what they call a ramp rat. Uh, and what I mean by that is when you go to an airport and the airplane pulls into your gate, you see that ground crew that goes up under the plane and scurries around and like helps get the plane stopped and connects it to everything and gets make sure the jetway can get to the airplane and unloads the airplane. The reason why we're called ramp rats is because we scurry around like rats everywhere trying to get everything done. And so I did that for two years. Um, and then, uh, About the middle of my second year, I decided instead of being just a crew member, there was a class I could take to be a lead uh, out there, which means I was the one that got on the machine that actually pushed the airplane out into the the concourse. I was the one that went up on the computer and did all the numbers, so all the weight numbers so that the planes could bounce the way that they were supposed to to fly. I was the essentially if anything happened on that gate, it came on my shoulders. Yeah. Uh, you know, delays, problems, if there was any, if there was accidents, that kind of thing. Yeah. So I did that, but I went to that class. And as I told you in our pre-interview, my first official day as a ramp lead was the September 11th. <sighs> um, I'll never forget that day. Um, the night before I'd worked, I had worked late into the evening. I didn't go to bed till three, four in the morning. My wife calls me at eight o'clock in the morning. And, uh, well, at the time she was my girlfriend, um, she calls me and I literally pick up the phone and go, why are you calling me? It's eight o'clock in the morning. I went to bed at like three o'clock and she goes, turn on the news. And I went, why am I going to turn on the news? She said, turn on the news. And when she did literally at that moment, I saw the second plane going into the, uh, the towers and I just dead silent. And one of the reasons, but outside of just the sheer experience of it, knowing, knowing what was happening was the plane that went into the tower, I had loaded and unloaded. And I knew exactly how much weight went on that plane. I knew how many lives were on that plane. I knew what that plane could do when it came to flying that plane. And so I was just like, oh my God. And so. I then I then called my area because the airport on the on the bottom side they're all divided up into areas that you can go to to see what we needed to do and so the day ship supervisor who was an old crusty veteran was just like you need to come in to work yeah and, wow and so I did and I mean it was just for 3 days it was mass chaos at the airport cuz nobody knew what was going on um there were there were bags literally everywhere just because we had all these flights uh, the you know the US government grounded all all flights so literally if there was a gate open anywhere in the country there was a plane in it at that point because we didn't yeah. know we didn't know if this was a terrorist attack at the time we didn't know if it was an internal thing we we had no idea and the other issue that we ran into was the fact that um when you work in an airport, you get flight privileges. It's called non-revving. And the reason why it's called non-revving is because the, the airline doesn't make any revenue off of you. So you're a non-revenue passenger. And the issue that we ran in was when they ground stopped everything, there was a lot of employees that were stuck in other cities, other countries that couldn't get back because there were no airplanes flying. Yeah. And so it, 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 was, it was just a crazy time. Oh, 
I, I, yeah, I remember that. I remember that day. I saw the second fly going, flight going to the the towers too, and I went because I was up the towers six months and nine months prior to them going down in December two thousand. I went to the top of the the towers with my mum. Yep. I took my mum to New York, and then I went back with college six weeks later in February two thousand and one, and then mm. I went back in December to watch Michael mm. Jordan play at the Garden yep. in New York because he was my favorite player and he'd come back out of retirement. So, of course, yep. I had to go. And um, so I went to New York from Manchester um, three months after it went down. And um, I went to my friend who lived in Greenwich Village, who I stayed with. He had a broker up at the one of the buildings next to it. So we went to see the broker. And I had a bird's eye view literally right next to the ground where no one could even get past there. So I had some unbelievable sites that i will never get out of my mind and it was oh, just yeah. a devastating sight and even the, like the skeleton of part of the frame was still standing around the mm-hmm. rubble at the bottom it was uh, i don't know i can't i can't even describe the feeling anyway um so jason um we have a really good picture of of, of, of you now and you and, and your your life and how you grew up a little bit so and you mentioned about meeting your wife before we uh, go into the family. Um, let's talk about how you met your, your lovely wife, Jennifer. So as I've stated before, uh, before I got into education, I was working at the airport and anybody mm-hmm. that's ever worked at an airport, it's a 24, seven, 365 job. Mm-hmm. In fact, one day out there, I got to complain how I was working Christmas. And one of the old crusty veterans said, just because it's Christmas here, doesn't mean it's Christmas anywhere else. The world keeps moving. And so at the time in the airport life, you bid on the, on the schedule you want, like your days off and the, the better the schedule, the more seniority you have to have like years. So like, for example, as, as a lead ramp agent on where in the area I was in for me to get a day shift in a terrible area. I would have to be on night shift for 14 consecutive years before I would ever get on a day shift in a terrible area. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a, it was just because there was a ton of employees, a ton of people that had 20 plus years experience. And, you know, I was coming in at two years experience. And so it's just one of those, you got to pay your dues kind Mm -hmm. of things. So at the time I had a fixed Wednesday, Thursday off middle of the week. You know, I was always working weekends, definitely always working holidays. Um, and so I'd gotten home in the area that I lived in at the time, you know, even though I'm around Atlanta, I'm not in Atlanta. So like I'm 60 miles South of Atlanta. So, and even if I were in Atlanta, who goes out and parties on a Wednesday or Thursday night? I mean, yeah. you know, so, and at the time I was like in my early to mid twenties. And so I got online and I'm going to date myself, but it was back in the days of Yahoo chat where yeah. you could get in chat rooms. Yeah. And so I literally got on my computer at the time and I just got in a chat room and it was honestly, the reason why I got on there was I just wanted to talk to people. I just didn't want to be sitting in the house alone. Yeah. It was, it was there was no ulterior motive whatsoever. It was just, I'm, I'm tired of not talking to anybody. I want to talk to somebody. So I got in there. So at the time there were three Atlanta chat rooms and I got in the first chat, uh, chat room. And, you know, for those of us, my age, there's lingo that you put in there where people will understand. And, you know, I got in there and just said, Hey, um, is there anybody from this area of Atlanta? And typically there never was. Cause in a lot of those chat rooms, it was always people from Atlanta and North of Atlanta. It was never Atlanta and South of Atlanta. Mm. And so I got in there, I waited a few minutes, didn't hear anything. And I left out and I went to the second room and did the same thing and waited a little while, didn't hear anything, went to the third one, same thing. And so I was almost about to click to get off just cause I hadn't run across anybody and something told me just to go back to that first room. And I did. And this girl immediately messes me. Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.